Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes. And you're audible. Yes, Pastor. Pastor. Thank you, Jeffina. Okay, let's so let's begin um, uh, with a word of prayer. Can can one of us uh, lead in prayer, please? Can I ask Georgia to lead in prayer? Georgia Hamilton. Georgie, are you there? <coughs> okay, can Anita lead us in prayer, please? Uh, yeah, ma'am, yeah. sure, ma'am. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. You have given us, Lord. Thank you for each one of us, Lord, as we are gathered here for to learn from your word, Lord. Help us to understand, Lord. Holy Spirit, you guide us and lead us, Lord, and help us to learn everything that Pastor is teaching uh, teaching us, Lord. And bless Pastor, Lord. And I would like to give each one of us into your hand, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Anita. Well, so welcome to class again, everyone. Thank you for joining class. Uh, today we're looking at uh, chapter uh, 10. We just have two more chapters in uh, the kingdom of God. So we're looking at chapter 10, uh, the literal kingdom. Okay, so uh, all these um, uh, weeks that we've been studying, we've actually been uh, from chapters one right up to chapter nine, we've been studying which dimension or which aspect of the kingdom of God. Anyone can answer? All of these weeks uh, that we've been studying chapters one to chapter nine, we've been studying um, which dimension of the kingdom of God? Spiritual. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, yes, it's a spiritual uh, uh, kingdom that we've been looking at. So in chapter one, we learned that there is the spiritual and the natural dimension of the kingdom. Uh, the spiritual dimension of the kingdom has to do with uh, the king's domain uh, being established in the hearts and lives of people. So from here, the kingdom of God, so the kingdom of God is in us in our hearts and in our lives, and from our hearts and lives, the kingdom of God pervades or uh, affects everything that is around us. And we also saw that there is a natural uh, dimension of the kingdom, which is the literal government of the kingdom of God that God will uh, establish, uh, you know, not so uh, in the distant future uh, when Jesus himself will come uh, and rule the earth uh, from Jerusalem. And, you know, we call it that millennium kingdom. And thereafter, he will continue to rule. He still rules, but, you know, when he will be king, and there will be no governments other than the government. There will be no other earth of God. There will be no other kingdom than the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So the government of that kingdom, you know, will be administered by saints, by you and I, who are the heirs of the kingdom. So uh, in all of these chapters, from chapters 1 to chapter 9, we've been addressing the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. And um, the focus of our study has been uh, in the spiritual kingdom of God and how we can uh, relate to it here and now. Uh, but we also need to explore and understand the natural kingdom or the literal kingdom which the Lord Jesus will establish on the earth uh, at the beginning of the millennium rule, uh, the thousand year reign on the earth. So it's not just uh, enough for us to focus on the spiritual uh, dimension of the kingdom, but we also need to understand uh, the literal or the natural kingdom because we're all going to be part of that. You know, we are going to be uh, ruling uh, with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. We are going to be uh, because we are the heirs of his kingdom. Okay. Uh, we also saw God's, uh, in chapter 1, God's original plan, okay, in, uh, 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 we read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Can one of you please read that, please? Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 25 verse 34 Then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world Thank you so here uh, we've already studied this in, in quite a bit of a detail when we uh, we looked at chapter 1 you know where we saw that um, uh, you know uh, uh, the kingdom of god that god planned to uh, bring about on this earth is not something that he thought of you know after he created uh, the earth or uh, you know this idea didn't just co uh, come up uh, then but you know even before the foundations of the world god had this plan to uh, you know uh, uh, he had prepared a kingdom that he was going to establish here on earth and uh, that kingdom was uh, you know he had already prepared it for for the people that he is going to create to you know uh, to have dominion and subdue and rule uh, in this uh, kingdom so god's original plan was to have a kingdom with the people who would uh, be heirs with him in that kingdom on this earth and uh, you know this eventually will have its a literal fulfillment when Christ the king himself will come and usher in his physical kingdom here on earth that is during the millennium rule here on earth okay uh, now let's look at uh, some things or some prophecies uh, uh, you know from the old testament that talks about uh, you know the fulfillment of this uh, literal kingdom or uh, the coming of this uh, literal kingdom that we are uh, going to uh, see okay so we look at uh, jacob's prophecy in genesis chapter 49 verse 10 can somebody read genesis chapter 49 verse 10 all of these scripture passages are in uh, the pdf copy so you can just follow that and you can just read from that can anyone read that please genesis chapter 49 verse 10 Genesis 49:10 The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people Thank you Zelotoli so here as early as in the book of Genesis uh we have the prophecy of uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus who is the going to be the ruler the lawgiver the Shiloh means the the peacemaker or the prince of peace and he's going to come from the tribe of um, Judah okay uh, we also see that uh, this kingdom this literal kingdom that god is going to establish here uh, was foretold um, also to uh, as a covenant that god made uh, to david in uh, you know a second samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 13 and verse 16 Uh, when it says when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers i will set you up uh, i will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and i will establish his kingdom was 13 and he shall build a house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and was 16 says you know um, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you the throne shall be established for Ever. so here it says that you know your kingdom david's kingdom uh, shall be established before uh, you before and your throne shall be established forever so it's talking about one who would come uh, in the line of david uh, from the tribe of judah you know uh, that is talking about jesus because he came in uh, uh, in the line of uh, day king david and we know that uh, you know his kingdom is a kingdom that will be established forever and he will rule from eternity to eternity his kingdom is established for ever okay we also read this uh, uh, when uh, the psalmist says in psalm 132 verse 11 the lord has sworn in truth to david he will not turn from it i will set upon your throne the fruit of your womb so the psalmist remembers uh, the promise uh, he made uh, uh, to king david in second samuel chapter 7 verses uh, 12 to um, 16 Okay. so here we see that the covenant god is establishing that he will have someone sit on david's throne uh, you know uh, forever 
and uh, David's throne will be, uh, you know, uh, will be established for ever. And that's talking about uh, Jesus and his reign and his rule and his kingdom uh, that will be for eternity and his uh, kingdom is established for ever. We also read in Isaiah chapter 16 or verse 5 where it says, In mercy the throne will be established and one will sit on it in truth the tabernacle of David judging and seeking justice and hasting uh, righteousness. So in mercy, the throne will be established. It means that, you know, uh, in the end times, the throne of the Messiah, that's the throne of Jesus Christ, will be established. And uh, the Messiah himself will sit on the throne and he will be one who will, uh, you know, reign in truth uh, in the tabernacle of David. And his reign will be very wonderful, uh, you know, uh, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. So, you know, his reign will be a reign of righteousness and justice and uh, where truth will uh, prevail. We also read, um, uh, you know, uh, the covenant that God makes in, um, you know, the promise that he makes in Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 to 18. Also, can somebody read that, please? Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 to 18. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 14 to 18. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of his faith. Nor shall the priest, the Levite, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. Thank you, Jafira. So it says here that in those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of uh, righteousness. So in the context of the new covenant promises, you know, God promises that a descendant of the line of David uh, would be uh, the branch of uh, righteousness as uh, we read in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 12, Isaiah 11 verse 1, and in Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 5 as well. Okay, uh, here Jeremiah does, does not reveal, uh, uh, you know, too much or much about the coming Messiah as Isaiah does. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, he gives us a glimpse of Christ uh, as uh, who Christ is. And he mentions in his uh, in his book, you know, Christ is the fountain of living waters. We read this in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, uh, that, uh, you know, the Messiah of Christ is the good shepherd. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 4, and uh, chapter 31, verse 10. He's a righteous branch. Uh, you know, the Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. He's a redeemer. Uh, Jeremiah 50, verse 34. Uh, the Lord, our righteousness, again, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, and uh, David the king, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. So, you know, he's revealing who this um, this king is going to be who's coming in the line of David, and he, uh, you know, uh, just basically gives us a glimpse of uh, who this Messiah is or who this king is who uh, would, uh, would be a descendant of the line of David and would be the branch of righteousness. And it also says uh, in this verse, as Jephina read, that he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Okay, So there's great promises of restoration and blessings um, you know, under the uh, under the new covenant, uh, which would uh, you know be uh, would come about by the appointed man, uh, who Jeremiah refers to as a branch of righteousness, would also be a descendant of David, and uh, he says that he will not only uh, reign over Jerusalem and Israel, but over the earth, over all the earth. Okay, and he will bring judgment and righteousness on the earth. And it says also here in this verse that this is the name by which uh, she will be called the Lord our 
righteousness. So, you know, this would be uh, the title that will be uh, restored to Jerusalem under the Messiah, uh, 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 under the king who would come, who is the branch uh, uh, of righteousness, who comes from the line of David. Um, and no more would Jerusalem be a place of uh, idolatry, of rebellion, of shame, of destruction um, uh, that came from, you know, all the kings who ruled uh, Jerusalem, but it would be a city when this when this Messiah comes, when this King comes, this uh, the King who is a branch of righteousness comes. You know, uh, he would make uh, this city, which is a city of idolatry, rebellion, shame, destruction. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, you know idolatry and rebellion and shame and all of that in the Old Testament. Uh, also now, uh, you know, we see that uh, uh, prevailing uh, in, in Jerusalem. So it says now it would be a city and the people who truly find their righteousness in the Lord, their God. Okay, so uh, the king will not only come and rule and reign in Jerusalem, but he will reign over all the earth. And uh, his uh, rule, his kingdom rule, his kingdom reign, his kingdom dominion, his kingdom government, his kingdom values and righteousness and holiness uh, will, um, uh, will be exhibited throughout the earth. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Jerusalem, uh, the name itself will be changed as uh, and will be called the Lord our righteousness because it will be a city. Uh, and it have uh, and it'll have people a city that comprises of people uh, who would you know uh, find their righteousness in the Lord their God. So God made this covenant with David, you know that one of his descendants uh, will have a kingdom that will last or rule uh, and reign for eternity or for uh, ever. Okay, and uh, we also see uh, you know the prophecy that was made by Isaiah. We uh, we looked at it in uh, you know Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven. Uh, we looked at it in chapter two when we studied uh, the king and his kingdom. Uh, but we just uh, you know reiterate a few points of what we had uh, learned in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six to seven. So uh, can somebody read this, please? Uh, passage of scripture. This is a very fam familiar passage of scripture read during uh, Christmas season. So can somebody read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, please? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Existing Lord, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and they will be upon the David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform. Thank you, uh, Jeffina. So here it's promising about the child that is to be born. Uh, and also it's talking not just about uh, what the child will accomplish when, um, uh, when he's here on the earth, but it also talks about the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. Uh, and upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, uh, you know, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and for ever more. Okay, and it says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform uh, this. Okay, so uh, so here we see that you know um, uh, uh, it's not only talking about when the Messiah will come, but it's also talking about the future uh, literal kingdom that he will also come to establish. Uh, which will be a kingdom where he'll establish judgment and justice and righteousness uh, from the time that he's, you know, he's uh, born into this world and for even forevermore, which is talking about the literal kingdom that he's going to establish. And when we look at this uh, passage of scripture, we studied this in, in, uh, in chapter two, we said that, you know, God desires that his kingdom be a true representation of who he is as, King and uh, you know as Isaiah unfolds 
uh, the aspects about the government that the son of God would administer. You know, he's actually pointing out to the uh, to his names. And, uh, uh, you know, we know that God's name effectively des uh, describes his nature. We studied this even in Christology and in, in systematic theology. You know, uh, the, the names of God reveal the attributes, the character, the nature of God, who he is. And therefore, you know, the government of the Son of God uh, 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 that he will administer is an expression of who he is. Um, you know, uh, as an expression of his names and as king, uh, you know, his government, his rule, his reign and uh, uh, that we are experiencing now in the spiritual kingdom that we will experience in uh, in the natural kingdom, which is a literal kingdom, which we will experience literally, uh, you know, we will experience uh, his nature um, because he, you know, God, God, uh, you know, wants his desires, his kingdom to be a true representation of who he is asking. So as king, uh, you know, uh, his government will be expressed as something that is wonderful. Uh, we saw that the Hebrew word for this word wonderful is, uh, you know, miracle or, uh, you know, uh, uh, marvelous things. And we, we uh, you know, I also said that, you know, uh, God wants his kingdom to be saturated with the miraculous. Not only now, but when the literal kingdom, when he establishes, it will be a kingdom that will be saturated with the miraculous. And also his kingdom will be expressed as, you know, as uh, through his name, counselor, wonderful counselor. So the Hebrew word basically for this word counselor is advisor. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, and it's, it's an expression of uh, wisdom, it's an expression of the might of God, it's an expression of his uh, uh, power. So God wants his kingdom to be filled with his wisdom and he wants his people to be working in the wisdom of God. So in the literal kingdom, even as we are experiencing in part, we will experience the, you know, the, the manifest uh, wisdom of God in its full uh, 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 you know, in its full uh, uh, expression when he comes to establish his literal kingdom or in the millennium kingdom, we will experience uh, the, you know, the complete, <coughs> sorry, we will experience a complete wisdom, the working of the wisdom of God uh, in his kingdom and also in and through us. And his kingdom is also going to be an expression of who he is as an everlasting father. It's going to be a kingdom of compassion, of love and care of a father towards his uh, children. It's also be going to be a kingdom where uh, the prince uh, of peace is going to be expressed an expression of shalom. So when we say shalom, it's meaning a uh, wholeness, well-being, prosperity, um, a life, uh, peace and perfect wholeness okay so he's a king who will bring about wholeness and total uh, well-being so the miraculous um, the wisdom of god the power of god the fatherhood of god uh, 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 will be seen in his kingdom even as he comes to rule uh, and he will bring about you know wholeness and judgment and justice and all of these are the different facets of um, God's uh, kingdom or God's government uh, uh, you know uh, wherever God exerts its influence throughout uh, the realm of his domin dominion uh, there will all of these things will be evident even as uh, you know the kingdom of God is in us uh, even as we carry the kingdom of God wherever we go whether we go to the marketplace whether we go to our offices whether we go to church whether we are at home uh, you know we are interacting with our neighbors or uh, we are on the street we are actually wherever we go we are carrying the kingdom of God uh, his dominion his rule his reign uh, and we we are exerting his influence and who he is, uh, you know, uh, in and through us uh, wherever we go, wherever we step in. Okay. And also these are the facets of um, uh, his kingdom that we will see in uh, the literal kingdom that he comes to um, establish. So uh, we look at what um, uh, was foretold by us uh, to us by Jeremiah. We look at the prophecy uh, by Isaiah. Uh, now we look at what was foretold uh, by Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we read that 
in the days of these kings, uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. So when God comes, when Jesus comes to uh, establish the millennium kingdom, you know, uh, there will be this war, and he will overthrow all the rulers uh, uh, of the kingdoms of this earth, and he will set up his kingdom, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed. No one can destroy his kingdom. His kingdom shall not be left to other people, but, you know, uh, will be ruled or governed by his saints, and uh, his kingdom will break uh, into pieces and consume all the other kingdoms and his kingdom shall stand forever to all eternity okay and then we see that you know when the uh, you know when the israelites were taken to um, in captivity to babylon uh, we see that you know there was a temporary pause of the lineage of kings in the line of david um, uh, but we see that uh, we read in um, Luke chapter 1, verse 30 to 33, where uh, the angel comes to Mary, appears to Mary, and says that there would be uh, one who would be born through her, uh, who would be called the Son of the Highest, the Lord God, and uh, uh, Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the uh, house of Jacob for his forever and his kingdom. There will be no end so uh, you know after the the reign of king jeho king, king of judah which we read in uh, jeremiah chapter 36 verse 30 there was no king that sat on the throne of david so in jeremiah chapter 36 verse 30 we read therefore thus says the lord concerning jehoiakim king of judah he shall have no one to sit on the throne of david and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. So in the lineage of the kings of Ju uh, Judah, there was a temporary pause when, uh, when after the reign of King uh, Jehoiakim, uh, when uh, the Israelites were taken uh, into captivity by uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of uh, Babylon. So after uh, a big pause, silent period for many years, you know, we read in the New Testament, the angelic announcement in Luke chapter 1, verses uh, 30 to 33, where it says, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Okay. So here, after the many years of a silent period of no one sitting on the throne of David, uh, the, the angel announces to Mary that um, this son will be born, uh, she will conceive in a womb, will be great, will be called the son of the highest and uh, God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign in the house of Jacob forever and says of his kingdom there will be no end. So we're seeing the, uh, the, the prophecy that we read in, uh, in uh, that's given to Jacob in Genesis, then Jeremiah, then Isaiah and Daniel uh, seem fulfilled uh, partially here through uh, Jesus when he was born and when he came and initiated the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, which is a spiritual kingdom. And uh, we will also see that, you know, um, he will come again and he would establish his kingdom uh, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. His kingdom will be for eternity to uh, eternity. Okay, so the angel announced that uh, Jesus would, uh, you know, be the one who will sit on the throne of David and rule forever a kingdom that will have no end. Um, and so we see that he introduces a spiritual dimension of the kingdom first, and then he'll come back to fulfill it in the physical dimensions. Okay. 
let's look at um, so that are the prophecies of the old testament and uh, how it's going to be fulfilled how it's fulfilled partially and how it will be fulfilled completely when jesus comes we look at uh, jesus's teaching on the literal kingdom and uh, we will read matthew chapter 8 verse, uh, verses 11 and 12 so can one of you please read matthew chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 please Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into other dark, outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, Roslyn. Uh, so here it says that many will come from uh, the east and west and sit down with uh, Abraham. So the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, that Jesus saw such faith uh, present in the Gentiles, you know, uh, faith uh, in in his uh, in his kingdom, faith in him, faith in his miracles, faith that he can heal. Uh, you know, when he saw the fact that you know the Gentiles had such. Uh, faith that that faith was present in the Gentiles, you know, uh, it caused Jesus to announce that there would be Gentiles also in the kingdom of heaven, and they also will sit down to dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this was something as a radical idea to many of the uh, Jewish people in Jesus's day because they assumed that this great uh, messianic uh, banquet you know, uh, would be comprising only of the Jews and would have no Gentiles in them. And, uh, you know, uh, when Jesus corrected uh, their, uh, their idea, they were, you know, very upset, they were very angry, and it, you know, it, uh, it aggravated more of hate and, um, you know, uh, the intention to get done with uh, him. So here Jesus is actually correcting uh, two mistaken ideas. Uh, uh, so he says that, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the darkness. So Jesus is reminding uh, his Jewish listeners that just as the Gentiles, uh, you know, uh, racial identity, you know, uh, was no like no barrier to the kingdom, their racial identity was no guarantee to the kingdom itself. So, you know. Um, even though the Gentiles, uh, you know, um, were uh, people who are, the Jews considered they would not be part of the messianic banquet or the kingdom of heaven, you know, uh, Jesus says now, you know, they are going to be part. Uh, so their racial identity is not a barrier to for them being part of the messianic banquet or being part of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the same way, you know, being Jews, you know, Jewish racial identity is no guarantee that they would be part of that messianic uh, banquet or that part of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, though Jews were considered to be the sons of the kingdom, uh, he says that they would, you know, still end up in hell. Okay, so he's co uh, correcting their, their mistaken ideas here, both their mistaken ideas. One that, you know, Gentiles will not be part of the kingdom. Um, and only it will be Jews. And the second thing is that, um, uh, you know, that uh, the Gentiles will go to hell and the Jews will, uh, you know, uh, will be, uh, are those who are sons of the kingdom. He says, you know, though some of you are Jews and you consider yourselves to be the sons of the kingdom, but you might end up in uh, hell. And, you know, the Gentiles uh, may not, some of them may not end up in hell. They will be part of that uh, kingdom of heaven, part of the messianic uh, Banquet. So this is what Jesus thought about the literal kingdom. So the literal kingdom is not comprising only of uh, Jews, but also, you know, of the Gentile world. So everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, uh, everyone who uh, has um, accepted him, accepted what he's done on the cross, accepted that he's God, uh, accepted their sinners and received forgiveness of sins, they would be part of the messianic banquet. They would be part of the kingdom of heaven. And it's not just those who are uh, called the sons of the kingdom. It's not just the Jews or just not the Christians. Uh, you know, people who are born into uh, Christian households, Christian families, Christian parents. It's not that that they would be part of um, the kingdom of heaven, uh, but they might also land up in hell. 
Okay, and we uh, read in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 15, uh, we read a parable. Um, you know, um, uh, we already looked at this parable, but uh, we can just look at it, uh, you know, we just read it. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven. So we, we know that, you know, we, when we were talking about um, uh, kingdom parables in chapter 7, uh, you know, uh, uh, we said we saw all the kingdom parables and, uh, you know, the parables that talked about the kingdom of heaven. And every time Jesus uh, wanted to make sure that, you know, whatever he's saying, he, he's uh, he's telling them that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants telling those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen uh, and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready, come to the wedding. But they made light of it and they went their ways on uh, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their cities. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out on the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on the wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Okay, so the Pharisees, when they heard this parable, you know, they were able to understand that Jesus is referring to uh, them and this wedding banquet, this messianic banquet. And, um, you know, basically Jesus is saying that, uh, you know, um, uh, he sent out his um, his prophets, uh, the priests, he sent out uh, uh, judges to these people, but these people did not heed. Uh, they made light they, uh, of God's ways. They went their own way. Then when he sent uh, his own son, they seized him and uh, killed him. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, and what did the king do? The king destroyed all of them. And he said, you know, uh, that, you know, the Jews, whoever don't accept uh, the gospel or, uh, or that God has sent his son uh, to save the world, to be the Messiah of the world, you know, uh, he says that now, uh, you know, the Gentiles, the invitation will be sent out. Uh, to the uh, Gentiles. So the teaching here is on the literal kingdom uh, where the Lord uh, Jesus indicated that there would be many others from the non-Jewish world would be part of this eternal kingdom. So all of those from the uh, Gentile world, you know, all of them on the streets, everyone were not Jews, they were invited. Those who accepted the wedding banquet, they came in uh, and those who did not were left behind. And the um, and, you know, Jesus says that the very ones through whom that, uh, you know, God had planned to release his kingdom on the earth. Remember the kingdom that he had planned even before the foundation of the world. Uh, he wanted it uh, to be uh, released here on the earth through his chosen people. Uh, the Israelites, the Jews, uh, they, he wanted them to represent God, uh, represent uh, his, uh, his nature, represent his names. Uh, represent his laws so that other nations would know him but you know they rejected him and he says because they rejected him they would be cast out and the pharisees you know who were jews they easily uh you know could understand what jesus was saying they were so angry with him that uh, you know uh, they went and began to plot how they can really catch him in his own talk so that they could uh, you know, get done with him and, uh, you know, just uh, finish it. Okay. So, um, 
We will also look at, uh, this is what Jesus taught in the parable. We will also look at a few more scripture passages that talks about uh, the coming, the full view of the coming of the kingdom of God. So we will read Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. So if one of you can please quickly turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Another one can turn to Mark chapter 9, verse 1, please. Someone else can turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 27. And uh, someone else can turn to Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. So can somebody please read uh, each one of these references? We'll begin with Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew 16, 28. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalyn. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Mark 9, 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. Uh, can somebody read, uh, somebody else can read Luke 9, 27, please? Same thing, it says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Okay, the last scripture passage, can somebody read Matthew 17, 1 to 8? Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 to 8. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them upon a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased to hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Amen. Thank you, uh, Jeffina. So here we see that during uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus gave uh, some of his disciples a view of uh, the glory of uh, his coming kingdom or the literal kingdom. And he prepared them by saying that some of them you know, would not uh, uh, die uh, until they saw the power of the kingdom of God and of the Son of Man in that kingdom. So he's talking about, uh, you know, people in his time, they would, uh, you know, they would not die till they see the power of the kingdom of God and the Son of Man in that kingdom. Now here we see that Jesus is emphasizing uh, an important truth that, you know, walking uh, with Jesus or living a life uh, in Christ or being in Christ or, you know, when we receive salvation, you know, we become a new creation uh, and uh, we are in Christ. It does not mean uh, that this life will be just a life of death and, you know, having to carry our cross and bearing our cross and carrying it daily. It also means a life of power and glory of the kingdom of God. Amen. You know, we can also uh, taste, uh, you know, the life the life means the Zoe life, the, the eternal life, the, the God kind of life. So the eternal life is not something that is uh, we will experience way into the future. It's a hope that we will experience this eternal life way into the future. But this eternal life is uh, not an eschatological hope, but this eternal life is something that is also a realized eschatology. That means uh, we realize it here and now as soon as we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you know, uh, the life of God is in our spirit, man. We experience the fullness of the life of God. We experience the, the Zoe life of God, the God kind of life. Now, you might be saying, 
when I don't experience it, uh, there can be various things that are hindering the sin because we are feeding our sinful nature, our carnal nature, the evil desires of our uh, of our carnal nature. Our mind is not renewed uh, because we're born again only in our spirit man, but not in our mind and in our nature, in our nature and in our minds, uh, in our set, in the way that we think, our thinking perspectives, our culture, our lifestyle is all, you know, um, uh, kind of still uh, adhering or, uh, you know, uh, submitting or um, uh, pursuing the things of the flesh. But when we, um, you know, pursue the things of God, when we obey him, when we submit to him, when we adhere to him, when we, our desire is to please uh, uh, God and, uh, you know, to grow in our spirit, man, to be holy and righteous as he has given us a right standing in grace and righteousness and holiness, you know, when we're pursuing that, we will surely you know, experience uh, 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 the Zoe life, the eternal life, the God kind of life here and now, because it's a realized eschatology. It's not just eschatological hope that we will re uh, realize and way into the future, but we can experience a taste of that. We can experience the power and the glory of God, who he is and what he does uh, today in our lives, even as we're living uh, uh, in the spiritual aspect of the or the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. So Jesus promised some of his disciples would see a glimpse of that power and glory even as he manifests his uh, the glory of God here on earth. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration that uh, we read in Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 8, Jephina read for us, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration, they had a glimpse of what Jesus would look like you know, in his glorified state, uh, bright and radiant, um, and similar to what, you know, uh, uh, John describes in the book of uh, Revelation. So God's kingdom is, um, you know, a kingdom not just of uh, persecution, of crosses that we have to bear, of pain and suffering, but it's also a kingdom of power and glory, okay? Uh, and then, you know, we look at the signs of the coming of the kingdom, uh, we will look at um, Matthew, Luke chapter 21, verses uh, 27 to 32, where it says that the Son of Man will come in the clouds with power and glory. And, um, you know, and um, now when these things will begin to happen, he says, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And then he spoke of the parable of the fig tree. Uh, you know, look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding. You see and know for yourselves that someone is now here. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is uh, here. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. So here Jesus is giving a description of the end time, a period just before his coming, when he's going to... Uh, set up his literal kingdom. He gives us some signs that will happen uh, simultaneously in one generation. And that same generation that will see the signs will also see the coming of the literal coming of the kingdom of God. And then he talks about this parable. And the idea is that when of this parable is that when the fig tree buds, uh, there is an inevitable result that is summer is near and the fruit is coming. In the same way, uh, Jesus is saying, you know, when you see all of these signs, uh, the coming of Jesus uh, in the glory with his church to this world will, you know, inevitably follow. So when you look at all of these signs, you know, uh, know that, you know, the coming of Jesus uh, in glory with his church to this world will inevitably follow. So G Jesus did not refer to his own generation or that of his disciples that will see this, uh, you know, literal kingdom. But he's talking of the generation that will see the signs um, uh, of the coming of this literal kingdom way in the future, the generation that will be there to see the signs. And he says that these, this generation that will see the signs will be the same generation uh, that will also see uh, the coming, the literal coming of the kingdom of God. Okay. So we'll um, stop, pause here. We'll, uh, we have just one minute for our break. Anyone has any questions? Any questions?
Okay. If there's no questions, then uh, we'll just go for a break and then we'll begin um, looking at uh, the next sign of the kingdom of God, uh, which is mentioned to us in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and Mark chapter 11, verse 10. Uh, we'll look at it after our break. Okay. <laughs> 